My name's Everett Bassett. I'm here with my wife, Sharon. We're from uh, upstate New York, where I was in ministry there for a while, and um, retired to Virginia four years ago, and currently live on the ocean front, uh, where we've lived for the last two years. And we attend uh, the gathering at Scott, uh, but we've had a chance along the way to appreciate uh, Pastor Amanda and her gifts. And I'm so excited to see those gifts coming to this church and um, to hear about the great things that are going on in this church. I've heard a lot about you, but now uh, to be here and to uh, just to see it, to experience your welcome and your, your love and uh, all the ways that you are serving God is uh, just a great pleasure. So I'm honored to be here, especially if it gives uh, Pastor Amanda a chance to uh, sw switch gears and spend uh, some time uh, on the task of planning for the church. Our scripture lesson, um, I just lost, but it will come. There it is. Um, is a familiar story. It comes from Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 3. And before we read that, would you pray with me, please? Dear God, you have spoken through these familiar words for many, many years, for generations. We ask that you'll speak to us now and bring them to the heart of each person here, that all of us, each of us, will be able to hear exactly what you would say to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. And truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So much is broken. Doesn't it seem sometimes that we live in a hopelessly broken world? People fighting, anger boiling over, Oceans boiling over, inflation boiling over, racial injustice, viruses, political infighting. The world is broken, boiling over. This would be the worst time in the history of the world if not for every other time. Because the truth is the world is always broken and always has been. It reminds me of a Peanuts cartoon. Now, here's a heads up. Some people like to know kind of when the sermon's about to end. So this sermon begins and ends with a cartoon from the funny papers. So it's kind of like the signs of the end times in the Bible. When you hear the second comic strip referenced, get thee ready for the end of the sermon is near. <laughs> Only don't look too happy about it. That would hurt my feelings. But Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I've got the worst cold in the history of the world. 
And Charlie Brown says, what makes you think it's the worst cold in the history of the world? And Lucy says, because I've got it. And that's our lament. To us, this is the most broken the world has ever been because it's happening to us right now. But the truth is the world has already been broken from the second page of the Bible on. That doesn't comfort us much. Every day we see outrageous and hurtful things and it's hard not to feel broke. So it seems to me that we can do one of two things. First of all, we can shut it out. We can retreat from all the noise and just shut ourselves up into our own little shells and pretend that the big bad world can't touch us there, that we can simply escape into nice thoughts. Now, sometimes we have to, right? You can't just live every minute dwelling on bad stuff. I'm always intrigued to read the story in the Bible when Jesus met a man who was out of his mind. And it says, the man lived among the tombs. And I've always wondered what came first. Did he live among the tombs because he was out of his mind? Or was he out of his mind because he lived among the tombs? And either way, it strikes me that someone who watches cable news and disturbing internet and hateful radio for six hours or more a day has chosen to live among the tombs. If you open yourself up to that kind of anger and negativity, then you're going to be dwelling in a dark place. And yes, maybe going a little out of your mind. So you can't just dwell on it all the time, but you also just can't run away from it. This is the only world we've got to live in. And for all of the good intentioned people to just hide away could only make it worse. And that's why it's important, I think, that God has given us another choice not to run away from the brokenness of the world, but instead to be broken with Jesus. We're going to be broken no matter what, but we can be broken with Jesus, and I believe that will make all the difference. And what this morning's scripture lesson is about is exactly that. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell this story, but tell it in different ways. But they all tell the story about a woman coming to Jesus while he was at dinner and pouring oil on him. And then they all tell us that that made everybody mad. The ostensible reason for them getting mad is that the ointment was expensive. It was worth 300 denarii, or the rough equivalent of a whole year's wages. Think of what that could mean to a poor person out on the street. This event happened during the Passover season, a time when the poor lined the streets in Jerusalem because all the Jewish pilgrims from around the world traveled there at the time, and they were expected to be generous. A poor person really needed a strong Passover season to survive. And then here is this extravagant breaking of a vase and pouring out an ointment that could have helped so many. It did not look good. And it did not make Jesus look good. Well, that was one objection on the surface. But there was another, I think. We can imagine that there was some real disgust in seeing a woman stride into a man's event in a man's world and do this outrageous thing. 
The writer Mark never tells us the name of the woman or anything about her. Who was she? Did she live there? Was she a neighbor? Did she come off the street? Had she followed Jesus from town to town? Was she rich? Was she poor? Was she a sinful woman or a righteous woman? We never know. All we know is what she did. Now, we know the name of the man who owned the house, Simon the leper. But it might as well have been Bob or Fred, because we don't know a single thing that he did. But this anonymous woman will be remembered forever, said Jesus, not because we know her name, but because we know what she did and what was on her heart. And here we are 2,000 years later talking about it. He was right. What she did was important for a couple reasons. First of all, it was important for what it represents in the story of Jesus. Jesus said, she has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Now, in the time and culture of Jesus, and really in any ancient culture, when a loved one died, their body was treated with great respect. And anointing is a big part of that. Anointing with fragrant oil would be very common. But when Jesus died on Good Friday, it was among criminals as the Jewish Sabbath approached. So there wasn't much time or opportunity for his loved ones to tend to his body. He was wrapped and he was hastily sealed into a tomb. And that ate away at his followers, especially the women, his mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, and others. For the next 30 hours or so, they fretted that their loved one was not properly honored after he died. And the first moment they could, the crack of dawn after the Sabbath, the morning that we call Easter, they hastened to the tomb, hoping for some chance to anoint him. And that was when they discovered the greatest news ever. And Easter, of course, is the story of great joy for us. It eclipsed everything else. And yet, it appears that the fact that Jesus' body was never anointed after his death was still a thing for Mark's readers. But it was okay, as Jesus explained, because he had been anointed beforehand. And the woman who did it would be known for doing this forever. That's one reason her act is important. But the other one may be even more outstanding. What an act of sheer devotion. She intruded where she wasn't supposed to be. She did it despite criticism and scolding. She broke her vase. She poured out precious oil. She could have just poured a little oil out of a bottle, but she was in all the way. This was an extravagant gesture of devotion. And I think of her sometimes when we have discussions about having beautiful church buildings and nice windows and so on. And I've heard that same objection come up. You know, there are a lot of poor people in this world. Why do we spend so much on steeples and concrete? And I get that. We want to be generous. We want to take care of needs. But there are also times, I believe, when you simply do something big and beautiful for God, out of devotion. And that feeds the poor, too. Let her alone, said Jesus. She has performed a good service for me. She brought the best that she had, not appropriate in everybody's eyes, but it was her best. And for Jesus, that was more than good enough. So back to this broken world. 
We can try to escape from it and we'll never succeed. Or we can follow the example of this unnamed woman. Bring our broken vessel before God. Break it open. Pour it out. And let Jesus turn it into something beautiful. Because this is the ironic thing. I've seen over and over in my life and in the lives of others that it's the broken parts of us that God can use the most. It's our tears that water God's garden. Now, I don't want to say this lightly because there are devastating things that happen in our lives. And some of you may be going through things like that now. There are seasons in our lives when we're doing well just to get up in the morning. But even then, I believe, God is working. And the truth is, that place where the pain is can become the strongest part of us. One of my favorite songwriters is Leonard Cohen, who died last year. Didn't like to hear him sing, but his lyrics were often amazing. And he knew scripture backwards and forwards. And he wrote a song called Anthem that I think may have had this morning's scripture in mind. It's about the pain and the suffering in the world, and the chorus goes like this. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. And again, I don't say this lightly, but whatever pain you've been carrying, and we all carry something, may be the very place that God is trying to let light come into your life. That's not why bad things happen. They just do. But when they do, God can do amazing things with our broken vessels. When I look back at the lowest points in my life, those are the moments when I learn the most about prayer and about healing and about grace and about God. I didn't ask for those things, but they are the things that opened me up so that God's light could shine. And I think that's how God works. Sometimes I imagine that we're kind of like, here's the second sign, Dennis the Menace. Maybe some of you saw this comic. They're at the dinner table, and there's this plate of food in front of Dennis, and his mother has a very unhappy look on her face. And Dennis is saying, no, Mom, I do like your cooking. I just don't want to eat it. <laughs> well, I think we like God's cooking. I think, I think we like the oceans and the mountains and the dolphins. We like the sunsets, and we like the air we breathe. We like the freshness of spring. We like the fellowship of God's people and the good news and the promise of heaven. There's a lot of good stuff on God's table, but not all of it is appealing. The bad comes with the good. And for some reason that's above our pay grade, God can't just weed out the broken stuff without doing damage to the good. That's what the cross of Jesus Christ is all about. Jesus had to die so that this broken world could be saved. But after Good Friday comes Easter, and in the middle of pain and brokenness, God promises that when we bring our hands together, when we bring our prayers together, when we bring our pain together, there is healing and there is hope. And that's what God brings to your brokenness and to mine this morning. Let the light shine in. Amen.